is this uh, spread called Marmite. I don't know if you have it in New York City. I have an Australian cousin. <laughs> right, I go, that's, that's Vegemite. But, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Marmite. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, whatever it's, might, it, it, whatever <laughs> might I've tried, all the mites have been terrible, and I, I have um, a uniform I, prejudice, although I wouldn't say prejudice because I think it is an informed, correct judgment uh, against all mites. <laughs> This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to episode six of the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You just heard my guest this week, Modern Money Network research scholar Nathan Tankus. And in spite of Nathan's obviously incorrect opinion of Marmite, Nathan does have a wealth of insights on other matters. In this episode, we cover foreign exchange rates, inflation, government bond issuance, Venezuela, the euro, and the price of Marmite. I'll be honest with you, this episode I'm going to have to listen to a few times because there's so much in it. Apologies, but my co-host Patricia was a bit poorly for this episode, so it's just me asking the questions this time. If there are topics you'd like covered or questions you'd like our guests or ourselves to do our best to answer, please get in touch. If this is your first time listening and you want to know what MMT is, I'd advise you to go back and listen to the other episodes in order, because we lay out MMT in a pretty easy to understand way. But for those people that want to just plow on regardless, here is my overview of MMT as I see it. Apologies to those who already know this stuff, but I think it's worth going over old ground even just to refresh ourselves. My story is in 2008 when I started taking an interest in economics. It was because I couldn't get my head around two things. Here in the UK, we were being told that our government had run out of money, but also that we were spending billions of pounds to shore up the financial sector. So there was no money and lots of money at the same time. And it got me thinking, well, what is money? Most of us correctly know that it has nothing to do with gold or any precious metal anymore. Our pounds sterling are not convertible for gold or anything for that matter. So how can pounds be scarce? They're not dug up out of the ground. How does money come and go at the scale of a nation? So I started reading books and watching talks on these things. And then one day, I heard a well-known talk by MMT founder Warren Mosler. And the talk goes like this. He says to the audience, I take out my business cards. Would anybody like to work for me cleaning the carpet after this seminar? I'll pay you one for every 10 minutes. No takers? Okay, I will pay you two for every 10 minutes of work. Still no takers. Oh, then I add one more thing. There's a man at the door with a 9mm machine gun, and he works for me. And you can't get out of the room without paying him one of these business cards. Now who wants to work for these cards? Everybody. The man at the door is the tax man, and I just turned litter into money. When I heard that, it was a light bulb moment for me that helped me understand how fiat currency works. The government imposes a tax in a token that no one else except the government is allowed to create, and then the government offers to pay the private sector for goods and services in those tokens. And because the private sector need these tokens, these government-issued tax credits, otherwise known as money, more accurately, pounds in the UK, these tokens now have value. People will sell what they have, like their time and their labour, to get pounds. How many business cards could Warren Mosley issue? as many as he wanted, until the floor was clean. How many pounds can our government issue? As many as it needs to, to provision the country with things that the country democratically agrees it needs, like the NHS, public transport, infrastructure, schools and hospitals. As long as the resources needed to create these goods and services, time, labour, materials, as long as these things exist and are priced in pounds, the government can afford to spend as much as it wants on them. Full stop. The UK government can never run out of pounds. Therefore, involuntary unemployment and austerity are government policy choices that can be reversed at the stroke of a pen and a keystroke at a central bank. MMT economists cite other historical examples of governments or entities provisioning themselves in this way. One is when the British colonised Africa. The colonialists wanted locals to work for them, so they offered jobs that paid in money tokens, coins that the colonials controlled the manufacture of. We can imagine how it played out. The locals said, no thanks, I don't need a job. I've got everything I need. The colonials said, well, you're going to need to earn these coins to pay the hut tax. The locals would say, what's a hut tax? Well, it's where you pay us this many coins by the end of the week or we burn your hut down. And then the locals figured, all right, I guess I need a job. 
The idea that money spontaneously sprung up free of coercion, that money came from the private sector's desire to have money tokens for convenience, has been debunked many times. Economists and anthropologists call it the myth of barter. And just to hammer this point home, in all these examples, the authorities imposing the tax were not taxing the people to get the tokens to be able to spend them. They were taxing people to make those people need the tokens so that the issuing authority can now create the tokens, as many as it wants, to get things done, to get things made. They can create these tokens without limit. This is how modern money works. The idea that government needs to take in more in taxes from a population to be able to spend more on that population is false. Anyway, thanks for indulging me. I'll get out of the way and let Nathan take over. Just a note on this chat. At the end of the episode, I asked Nathan what his recommendations are for further learning. And it seems like he's primarily recommending a film that he's in. But it's just that the film came up at the beginning of our chat and I brought it up again later. So I put the two segments together. So that's deceptive editing on my part. Also, you'll hear Nathan talk about Rowan. Uh, that's Nathan's Modern Money Network colleague, Rowan Gray, who was on last week's episode. And that's a freaking great episode, in my totally unbiased opinion. Anyway, I think that's it. Here's Nathan Tankus. I'm talking to Nathan Tankus, who is a research scholar with the Modern Monetary Network, sorry, Modern Money Network. And he's over visiting from New York. I'm very lucky to get some time with him. Hi, Nathan. Hello. And on a personal note, I've very much enjoyed and been enlightened by your conversations with Steve Grumbine on Real Progressives. Uh, so thanks for all of those. A shout out to Steve. Uh, thanks for everything, Steve. Okay, so just by way of introduction to you and to MMT, um, how did you get interested in the origins of money or what money is? Um, I think you and I maybe got interested at the same time or with the global financial crisis, 2008. Um, but, you know, start anywhere. Yeah, um, it was the financial crisis for me, absolutely. Uh, I was was in an, this alternative high school, um, which I eventually went back to to teach a class for a semester on what money is. Um, and it was January 2009. Uh, we have a few weeks with this sort of like special project before general classes start. And so by that point, you know, obviously a lot had already happened. And two of my teachers decided, two of my history teachers decided to start a class, uh, an economics class, which they gave some title, but essentially it was read the newspaper every day and, you know, argue about it and try to figure out what's going on. So you can imagine that someone who sort of wandering around doesn't really have any sort of intellectual focus and it's January 2009 and you're put in the situation where you're reading the newspaper each day, that's suddenly fascinating it's it you know it opens a whole new world and what's most interesting about it of course is it seems that no one really knows what they're talking about is that there's wild disagreements uh, of on the most base what seems to be the most basic questions about money and banking which of course you know as graber says these questions temporarily opened up all at once and then that conversation closed um, but I, w I was in that class right when the conversation opened, and it just completely captured me, and I was interested in reading everything. I bought a copy that summer of, of Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States because I figured I probably wasn't going to like that point of view and probably was going to lean to some sort of Keynes direction, so I wanted to read that first before I read everything else. At some point in that time period, I found uh, Minsky's book, because by that point it had already been reprinted. The, 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 the copies, the out-of-print copies that had been bid up to thousands of dollars uh, were, you know, <laughs> were a little bit of a thing of the past, and uh, so started reading Minsky, cause, especially because it was the only basically the only sort of alternative economics book that was available in the library because it had newly printed the library and it was the financial crisis you know the New York Public Library had picked up some bunch of copies so the mix of all these materials got me just completely trapped me in an interest in economics did uh, when you mentioned David Graeber just now uh, did you read debt the first 5,000 years well my, my connection to Graeber is especially um, interesting or fortuitous to me because um, 
uh, Matt Forstadter, who's a professor at uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, and writes about MMT and all and all this. He has a chapter in an old in an old collection from the mid two thousands on radical economics and labor called Anarchist Economic Thought, like sort of to treat something that doesn't usually have seen as having economic theories behind it. Um, he did, and in this book, he cites two old, two um, a number of pieces by Graeber. So I'd gone back and read anar- uh, fragments of an anarchist anth- anthropology and really liked it. And then I heard a rumor about this book that was coming. I heard this rumor around um, early summer, around this time, uh, seven years ago. And the rumor was, and there was like a little little notice with it, that Graeber was writing a book that was related to or connected to, uh, to MMT, which I didn't even know he had any you know, awareness of it at all, uh, and that it was coming about in, uh, in the fall and it was named Death the First 5,000 Years. And so that was, you know... Yeah, yeah, that was you know immediately captured my interest because I was already interested in his perspective in general, and then suddenly he was writing about things in my world, and of, and you know there there are you know as as with any sweeping book, there's going to be issues, and there are some issues that I have in the book, but overall it's a tremendous, incredible uh, book. I haven't gotten uh, a copy of Bullshit Jobs yet. But it just seems to me, and this is completely off the top of my head and, you know, badly thought out, but I'm seeing in the Twitter sphere now a lot of people talking about Graeber and bullshit jobs. And it, it's weird because I think that his work is now being leveled at. You see, this is why we need UBI and not a job guarantee because there's so much unproductive work out there. And, you know, the problem with you job guarantee people is you're, you're going to add to that pile of unproductive work and make work and stuff. So having written an MMT book, he's almost like he's written an anti-MMT book to follow well, up. Uh, first, I would say that I have not yet read bullshit jobs yeah exactly so um, I should I should also to, I should also say that yeah. the reason I'm in England in the first place is I'm attending a conference on Graeber's book debt the first five thousand years and I have a paper that I'm presenting uh, at that conference mm-hmm. you know, about MMT about neo um, and in that I've you know gone through a ton of his work either works that I've read uh, reread or, or read for example the recent collection with Marshall Salins on Kings so you know, I've tremendous respect for uh, for for Graeber and the other thing I would say about Bullshit Jobs is I um, bec- because I haven't read the book yet I'm reserving judgment in terms of what, what my ultimate conclusion was. What I would say is um, that just because there even if, if, even if we were going to accept um, a Graeber's diagnosis in its entirety that there's the an enormous amount of bullshit jobs out there that don't need to be done and that they're primarily in in the private sector, which is, you know, what he regularly puts forward. Um, I don't think the conclusion is, well, well, we just have to find a way to restructure society so everyone in a bullshit job um, leaves that bullshit job and then gets supported um, by UBI, and then we just have sort of the same structure without all these quote-unquote bullshit jobs. Um, you know, t- taking under consideration that his analysis on bullshit uh, jobs is on point, and mm-hmm. it's still in that analysis there is no room for... Um, for, for defining a space of socially useful work that's unprofitable. And that's the space that job guarantee provides. Now, the, the other thing is, if uh, a job guarantee is also a much easier enforcement mechanism for any sort of working hours regulation you want. I mean, if we want to start progressively moving to a society with less working hours, well, then we can give people more and more paid vacation times and a job guarantee. And that will force a reduction in working times in the private labor market as well. So I would say, you know, in addition to that, the the UBI answer, even if it was economically possible, which obviously MMTers argue against, that it um, doesn't uh, that it doesn't provide that that social space that a job guarantee provides, and you can. Um, pursue reducing working hours and potentially reducing bullshit jobs um, in a job guarantee framework. 
But as I said, I have enormous respect for uh, Graber's work and think that not just debt, but also his uh, Towards an Anthropological Theory of Value book, which is from many years ago, 2001, and the recent collection on Kings uh, with Marshall Salins is well worth reading. And in general, you know, agree or disagree, Graber is worth reading on any of these topics. Yeah, I'm a fan too. I, and. Um yeah, I just I haven't gotten around to uh, bullshit jobs yet. That's uh, yeah. that's it really. And it also, it's worth noting that he wrote a, he did an article for the Guardian in 2014 when the Bank of England uh, released their study uh, about money creation in uh, modern society. Was it called money creation in the modern world? Something like Somewhere. that. And uh, you know, and and so the, and I, I really thought that that should be game over for you know the old way of thinking of, of money creation uh, you know it, it's finally broken through and it, it should have been front you know in the middle of a crisis like we're in we're still in it this yeah. you know recession and, and the video uh, he did for yeah. the Guardian on uh, sectoral balances is one of the best explanations of sectoral balances you can wow. find Do you know what? Yeah. I haven't seen that yeah, it's, it's a nice two and a half minute video um, I think it's from around the same time but Regardless, that's also uh, extremely well done. Oh, thanks for that tip. Because it also has the infographic behind him while he's talking. It's the it's the perfect kind of um, graphic design engaging Great. Uh, type of, uh, type of visual art. Great. Okay. So look, let's um, uh, back up now. Um, so uh, how uh, once the light bulb went on for me in uh, MMT terms is that the government can't run out of money pounds. Um, I thought well, God, everybody needs to know this, you know, because our NHS is being deliberately underfunded for no reason. People are dying, suffering as a result. I think I thought to myself, I need to get people interested in this. And um, it's a bit of a broad question, but can you help me with that? Like, what is the most expeditious, quickest way to to say the key insights of MMT? Uh, well, I, I would say that. In, in general, it off, it's very audience-specific. There are things I would say to very particular audiences that I wouldn't say to another audience. Uh, like, for example, to a leftist, I find that the ex- using the example that Forstadter writes about um, in uh, colonial Africa of you know, just colonial authorities directly uh, imposing you know, pound obligations or franc, franc obligations to... Um, get people to quote unquote willingly uh, work uh, on plantations is a very you know it's crude but it's a very direct example of the of the chartalist mechanism and how that 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 colonial relation isn't about getting money or getting revenue from the colonies but they're about getting the exact the getting the the work and the the natural resources that you want to take from them for your own imperial purposes and i you know for for a left for a left wing audience that's an example that i will go to quickly um especially in um because in writing that piece uh for Statter, it's called uh, primitive accumulation and taxation it's using a term that's you know very popular among marxist primitive of accumulation as a frame for for discussing that that issue and so but i obviously you know if i'm trying to talk to some libertarian who is just you know anti anything government that's obviously not the example i'm going to go for because then then you know even if they accept the point at some level well they're just you're just you you're you're providing uh, an easy way to dismiss the point as just like well you you're showing how it's just coercive and brutal um and not seeing any sort of positive social value in the possibility of uh, public spending and public money um uh, I would say in in general, my kind of more general go-to, um, besides that sort of specific uh, uh, winding it towards the audience, is um, that as private people, as we were just walking around, we have you know bills on our po- on our pocket, our credit card. We don't think of ourselves as in a system. Um, not much in our public education is about teaching us as you know just one part of an entire encompassing system so we're not used to looking at it from any from any other point of view 
Um, particularly, we're not looking at, used to looking at money as a liability, as an obligation somewhere, because there's no practical situation in life where we have to really, you know, theoretically think through the processes by which these, you know, uh, these obligations become valuable to us to think through the, uh, the taxation process, the process through which money is accepted in payment of taxes and how that makes it valuable to us, or how money is uh, accepted in payment to banks, to think about uh, what concretely debiting our bank account means, thinking of it in terms of uh, destruction rather than it just you know going away from somewhere. Because from our point of view, whether our account gets debited to pay interest on our credit card or the, our account gets debited to uh, pay someone else else, to our point of view, it's, it's just gone. We're not thinking in terms of, well, what what is happening to their balance sheet or what's happening in the case of the interest to the bank's balance sheet. And it's that sort of system thinking. Start thinking about it from a bank's point of view. Start thinking about it from a state's point of view and sort of think about you how you fit in this larger framework that you can start uh, approaching um, money and uh, debt in a different way and in a way that I think... Uh, you know, follows from MMT, uh, and and so it's it's the, and then once you focus that money is a liability, it's like, well, why do they have this other liability? Well, this interest-bearing liability bonds is serving a particular purpose. Well, what is that purpose? Uh, you know, the the difficulty, of course, is that once you start asking those kinds of questions, they get get very complicated very quickly. Yeah, we could be talk. I could very easily be start talking about treasury tax and loan accounts and and all this you know technical stuff and repos and all this and you know there's a way of telling this story where. <laughs> your head immediately starts uh, swimming. Um, and, and so, but the questions, the, the questions which come from a very different perspective, which we uh, are used to from our ordinary lives, is the first step in sort of cleaving that open and quickly, because even if they are not convinced by your ultimate conclusions, when you have, when you push in their head to start thinking systematically rather than individually, that, that is sort of a, a seed that grows later. Mm. Yeah, I mean, a, an interesting phrase that I think pops open the questions for me is the macroeconomic reality of so, somebody spending is somebody else's income. There's yeah. no way around that. So GDP, you know, if, if we sold a trillion dollars worth of stuff this year, somebody bought a trillion dollars worth of stuff it, it moved around in the economy yeah. when it when that GDP increases by 500 billion from last year to this year where did that money come from is a, an interesting thing I think for people to start yeah. thinking about no like for where, sure you know it, it, you know where, where, and then and then it leads you to like where do pounds come from spending uh, uh, spending being someone else's income is definitely or some other entity's income yeah. is definitely one of the key points of sort of going from individual thinking to system thinking yeah um, I, it's and but it's uh, the reason I usually start with the money and money side is that that sort of system thinking is associated with sort of basic Keynesianism and as much as you know I you know agree with the the insights that come from that it's you know the often that leaves sort of the 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 tax of the taxation the the receive you know in the technical term the receivability the what's acceptable in payment of taxes question to the side and uh, becomes its sort of you know open its own open ended uh, hydraulic process rather than something that's um, framed and organized by money and law. Okay. So, um, so let's say we've got somebody's attention by saying taxes don't fund spending, and they come back with, "What do you mean? Of course they do. They go into a pot, and then they come out, and uh, we spend that in Britain on the NHS." What's your answer to that? Um, so, my answer to that is, you know, you, you can get take you know all sorts of like complex perspective again back to the tre treasury tax and loan accounts with the central bank and the treasury um, but fundamentally both the central bank and the treasury are administered uh, administrative agencies of the government and so because they're administrative agencies this is where the legal analysis comes in that for certain perspectives especially for understanding uh, public money and how 
government spending works, we can consolidate them. Uh, and that when you consolidate, the, consolidate them and then you look concretely what are the processes that are happening in spending, in taxation, in bond issuance, what, what fundamentally happens whenever the government spends, um, you know, for the most, you know, in, in the current specific institutional structures that we're focusing on, uh, the amount of settlement balances, the amount of money held in banks' checking accounts at the central bank goes up when money is, when money is spent. And, uh, in, and, then in af and then after the fact, some government agency issues or sells a bond to drain the, the, that money in that checking account. The reason that they do that, or the reason, or to be more accurate, the reason they did that before 2008 and before everyone started paying interest on settlement balances and uh, before there was all these excess settlement balances that existed in the system, the reason they did that was if they didn't, there would be either a te temporary excess or shortage of settlement balances, and that means that the interest rate that the central bank sets um, wouldn't be hit. If, you, if, if there's three banks and they desperately need uh, settlement balances to meet their reserve requirements, which they get you know, hugely punished if not, they're willing to offer higher and higher interest rates to get those settlement balances. And if they still can't get the settlement balances, the, the, the overnight loan market, the uh, loan between banks uh, overnight freezes. And so to, to prevent that, somebody uh, buys or sells a bond, um, in this case, because we're talking about a shortage, buys a bond, and to make sure that there's enough settlement balances that are circulating out there. But the, the, the broader perspective is that you know, every single time we're talking about an increase in money held by some private actors, and then afterwards, uh, someone else uh, has, who, who has a certain amount of money gets a bond, and or get, per, uh, purchases a bond, and then they have a bond instead of that money, and that bond is pretty cl is close to money. There's a term uh, in heterodox economics, moneyness, the idea that that rather than thinking about money as either existing or not existing, as either one thing is money and everything else isn't, that there's a hierarchy of money and certain items have certain qualities of money. Thinking of money as an adjective, something that uh, in certain situations, certain uh, monetary objects uh, have, or certain financial instruments have, and a bond has a very high degree of money. And in fact, you know, the mainstream discussion right now in in orthodox economics is all about bond, how government bonds are safe assets, and how there's you know, you know, in, in their vision of it, a quote-unquote shortage of safe assets. There's you know what Moser would. would has talked about forever. There's all these pension funds that, you know, for whatever reason, want this very high financial net worth, want these returns, want returns that they can rely on, safe assets, and there isn't necessarily enough out there for them. Uh, and so they're going around seeking some sort of safe assets, and the most, you know, obvious direct place to get some safe assets uh, is government bonds. And of course, the discussion in Europe, which is being highlighted especially right now uh, because of Italy and the political turmoil in Italy, is that uh, you, there's no real fully reliable safe asset in Europe because the ECB isn't providing, isn't guar essentially guaranteeing the moneyness of any, any bonds, any government bonds in Europe the way that every other central bank around the world guarantees the moneyness of a, of a particular government. You know, in, in that sense, you know, take, to take it back to the legal point I was making before, in these systems, you know, MMT is not just making a wild and random choice to consolidate the central bank and the treasury in England or the United States. They're taking a particular legal analysis, and I'm sure you know Modern Money Network is you know, filled to the gills with lawyers. Um, and, 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 folk, and in that specifically legal arrangement, saying that the central bank is administrative agency of one particular government. Now, in the Eurozone case, 
the legal analysis is obviously different because the legal system is different. In, the, in, in Europe, the, the highest court in the land is the European Court of Justice, and, uh, and that, that legal system isn't uh, beholden to any one government. And so the fact that it's actually a, uh, beholden to 19 or more governments means, in fact, that the ECB isn't beholden to any of them. Besides, maybe, you know, if you want to be more politically cynical, um, you know, a, a de facto yeah. relationship with Germany yeah. and uh, governments that are allied with Germany, like, you know, certain Eastern European governments. But fundamentally, yeah, but, but even that is, that's very contingent. If, if Germany tomorrow, um, if its current account surplus fell a lot and suddenly government spending uh, uh, went up a lot, maybe Germany would have the political influence to uh, pre- prevent a threat to um, its, to the uh, bond, to the speculator treatment of them as a, as, a, as a safe region. Or maybe they wouldn't. Maybe, you know, all those Eastern European governments and other governments who supported uh, Germany's crackdown on Greece uh, wouldn't be willing to support a uh, government crackdown or wouldn't be able to willing to support, you know, Germany suddenly, you know, saying what's, uh, uh, good for, uh, what's good for thee is not good for me. Yeah. So, I mean, it's fair to say, saying it in a short way, the power structure in uh, Europe uh, with the uh, member states and the ECB is nebulous, and that's all. That's where all the problems are coming from. Yeah, I, mean, I would. I mean, you know, you know there's, there's there's no sovereignty that you can track, right? There, there is to a certain extent, but it's it's very fragmented and ambiguous. Um, there's there's a famous essay um, in American left circles called "The Tyranny of Structuralistness," which is all about how you have certain uh, you certain approaches to consensus, not necessarily all approaches to consensus, um, break down because rather than using certain formal structures to to organize things, things are de facto organized by particular cliques who have popularity but no uh, formal relationship to everyone else. Um, and, um, you know, it's debatable whether that's necessarily true in other places, but it's, in, in a funny way, it's certainly true of the Eurozone. The Eurozone is absolutely the tyranny of destructionless. And in fact, if you go to, if you hear, read anything about those Eurogroup meetings, there is a real strong desire to present consensus to the world. But that consensus is enforced through the de facto inequalities between the groups. You know, the, the weaker ones, you know, follow along what Germany or other countries want to say. And, you know, the consensus is, you know, a pantomime and a, a fake one, and and but but Germany's role obviously is informal. There's there's no it doesn't say in the Maastricht Treaty, and you know Germany rules the roost, and you better do whatever you know Doctor Strangelove says. <laughs> uh, but you know in it arguably in a certain de facto sense that is true, um, and, and yeah, and so it's the, the but but certainly. The, the legal structure, the the legal structure, and the formal legal institution have not formally given German any, uh, Germany any particular role. It's a de facto role. It's a role in the, the ambiguity of of power and ne- negotiations, and that sand can shift. Um, and yeah. uh, I think, you know, it doesn't seem like that sand is going to shift uh, against Germany anytime soon, but I think you can be surprised how quickly the sand can shift when there isn't any formal legal arrangement underpinning the, the current uh, inequality. And unfortunately, what we've seen with Greece is that the sand is never going to shift in favor of what the Greek people want for their own country, Yeah, for instance. And, you know, Italy will probably go that way as well, right? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's fundamentally uncertain what's going to happen with Italy right now. Um, I think what's interesting about Italy is it's one thing to do what they did to Greece and for what's happened with uh, Eastern Europe. It's another thing for them to... for, 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 uh, for such a prominent uh, country in the Eurozone, which, you know... It might not be as prominent in France or Germany, but you know, Italy certainly is is important for Italy to be so publicly crushed by 
the undemocratic financial structure. And by, by, you know, it's one thing for Greek bondholders to de facto control the Greek government. It's another thing for Italian bondholders to de facto control the Italian government. And I think that, I mean, who, who knows exactly what's going to happen, but I think that if, if it, for example, if it happens in Italy and it happens in Spain, or if it ever happens in, say, France, um, this sort of disciplining mechanism, then that is a real fundamental threat to the political viability of the Eurozone. It's just, I don't see how it can, it can, hold, it can hold together. I mean, the, you know, you have to say, the, Euros, the, the, the Eurozone, the Troika, have done, you know, it's not been a pretty job, but a good job at holding the Eurozone together. They've obviously had that objective higher than the massive human cost, than the migrant crisis, again, than climate change. Um, but they have managed to keep the plate spinning in the air. Um, but I think that, you know, and, and then maybe they'll be able to keep the plate spinning in the, in the air uh, more. I mean, you should never underestimate uh, the, a, a ruling elite. But it, it does seem like uh, the explicit demonstration that democracy doesn't mean anything in more countries. Maybe, maybe Italy itself isn't enough. Maybe it would also need to be um, some other countries, especially uh, France. But it, that, that does show a fundamental turning point. You know, it's, it's one thing to happen to those people. But when the closer it comes to within the house, the, the, more, the more dangerous that it becomes and the more it's like, well, maybe something crazy, fundamentally crazy is going on here. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of a rightward drift in, in all of those matters of states. Oh, yeah. It's, well, it's just, it's, I, it's I, when I say collapse, I don't necessarily mean a, you know, a left wing. Yeah. I mean, the, the, right wing, the right wing turn in Europe has been persistent and ongoing. And, you know, as we see in the Italian coalition government itself, uh, this is, you know, the, the, the Eurosceptic position has been more coherent and consistent coming from the right than coming from the left. Um, even, you know, even Syriza, as fundamentally as they, as they were, you know, running, rushing head to head with Troika, had, you know, a fundamentally pro-European position because most, mo- a large part of, because be- being pro-European was very popular in Greece because of the, the legacy of the dictatorship. Um, but, so, you know, we, we've never really seen a consistent left, a left-wing Eurosceptic, EU-skeptic position being put forthrightly um, uh, by a um, political party, let alone one that's, you know, fully successful. Yeah, I mean, I think a mistake a lot of people make is uh, not separating out the difference between monetary sovereignty and sovereignty of your nation within Europe. You know, I think a lot of people, if they're listening to this, they might think, but personally, I'm, I'm glad that we didn't go into the Euro. Doesn't mean I was for Brexit. I voted Remain. You know, I wanted us to be in, uh, you know, at the European Parliament and working out our problems as a, as a United States of Europe. But like, when you tie the currencies together with no, when the currencies are locked and the, you're not politically homogenous, you well, you know, yeah. it's, ex- it's everything we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's trust. no. Yeah, there's no. I mean, well, the, the worst thing is that, in a certain sense, that there is has has been political integration, but because no one has wanted political integration, it's been political integration of the worst sort, run through primarily the ECB, um, with pri- primarily through the ECB and the discipline mechanism being the ECB rather than more democratic institutions. Yeah. If they if they made a choice to you know, political to politically integrate in a de- democratic way, the ECB would have been much more subordinated. Um, but that ha- isn't what ha- isn't what happened. And you know, you know, in a certain straightforward sense, you know, when you have when when you set up a system that centers power in in unaccountable elite, then you have uh, a a a. a a, a, a continent dominated by that particular p- uh, political elite and without democratic input. And, and I mean, it, in a certain way, it sort of just straightforwardly follows from the institution, the game that you set up. So, 
Um, what I really wanted to ask you about is, um, let's say we have convinced our uh, audience member that um, taxes don't fund spending, uh, we don't sell bonds to fund the shortfall between taxes and spending, we do it for other reasons, uh, and this person's now going, okay, I understand that, but if we spend for, say, full employment, um, and we achieve it, and we achieve price stability internally because we can make a fiscal adjustment to uh, stop in, uh, uh, inflation, there's still this thing, that, there's still this idea that we could be punished from people overseas with our exchange rate. You know, there, there was a point in this country where after the Brexit vote, a certain number of goods in our supermarkets went up by 10%. And uh, Tesco, one of our main retail outlets, stopped stocking these things because they were too expensive. They, or, you know, they, they turned around to the supplier, Unilever, and said, we're, we're not buying them off you because you've jacked the prices up. Now, to me, I think there's just a simple case of Monopoly, like one of one of the things uh, that this company Unilever was selling to uh, the UK is this is this uh, spread called Marmite. I don't know if you have it in New York City. I have an Australian cousin, <laughs> right? I go, that's, that's Vegemite, but oh yeah, yeah. Oh, Marmite. I, <laughs> but it's, it, whatever it's, might, it's, it, it, whatever <laughs> might I've tried, all the mites have been terrible, and I I have um, a uniform I, prejudice. Although I wouldn't say prejudice because I think it is an informed, correct judgment uh, against all mites. <laughs> Very good, right? So, so this this went up like uh, by ten by ten percent. This this particular spread, and it was I don't know. I think they called it Marmite Gate or something in the newspapers. And the idea was, look, this is what happens when you do things that the market doesn't like. God, the market doesn't like it. It takes things off the shelves. You know, it, it it's now become too expensive. And what happens if that? happens to all our food and it becomes too expensive and we can't afford it anymore. Now, to, to my mind, what happened there was Unilever saw the Brexit vote because other distributors like Unilever tried it in 2011. You know, um, there was a, 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 a brand called, uh, sorry, a distributor called Farm Foods, no, Premier Foods, and they they stop things called am, am, ambrosia, which is like a rice pudding, and oxo, which is like the stock cubes for making gravy. And they jacked it up. They they'd uh, sort of jacked up the prices by fourteen percent. And uh, again, Tesco refused to stock their goods. And to me, that's not you know there was no there was no Brexit involved there at all. I mean, I can't comment specifically on yeah, yeah. the on the Unilever thing, although I'm you know as, as a good uh, friendly you know uh, heterodox micro person, I think that in general. Uh, Monopoly and monopoly power is overestimated as as you know a real fundamental uh, force, if not in all markets, but in a, in a, in a lot of markets. Um, if you read, for example, uh, Truman Truman Bewley's um, long chapter on grocery pricing in his uh, forthcoming interview study on pricing, um, while there are a ton of obviously large grocery chains, they tend to be uh, very uh, very competitive. There seems to be a lot of very competitive relations, and you know, huge resistance towards uh, raising prices because of um, because of you know how much it alienates customers. Um, in the the Brexit case, yes, there's no question that um, in that in Brexit there was a large move down in the exchange rate, and you know. From, from a post-Keynesian point of view, which includes an MMT point of view, the major driver of price changes is cost changes. You do get markup changes. You do get the changes to the profit margin that uh, enterprises are trying to set. But usually that process is long-term and structural. And if, for example, a markup does r rise in the course of doing business, it's usually because they've cut costs. They've figured out a way to outsource the production or push workers more, and they've decided to, you know, keep the resulting increase in the markup themselves rather than cut prices. Not in all situations. Sometimes they cut prices, but uh, predominantly. So that, but, but price increases, the actual raising of prices, um, which isn't in and of itself inflation, but uh, goes into uh, the, 
the CPI and inflation indexes and all this. Um, cost changes are the, the predominant drivers, and if you have imported inputs or you're just selling imported uh, products, uh, you know, those cost changes can come into price changes. But the important thing about the exchange rate movement, yeah, you can be punished by um, by exchange rate markets, but of course it matters uh, how much, you know, for example, foreigners own, uh, have, um, have bank deposits uh, in, in, in your, denominated in your currency. Um, you, but that a one-time movement in the exchange rate is in inflation. And so you need a very particular situation and a very particular institutional setup to make an argument that their persistent uh, depreciation in the exchange rate is happening because of a particular spending approach. Now it can. For example, you can be trying to fight a war overseas and that can you know, involve buying a whole bunch of for foreign goods to give your soldiers, pay locals to... Um, provision your soldiers and that process if you don't have a way of imposing obligations on the, uh, on those populations can involve um, imports which and you know have people continuously get dollars that they don't want that they sell on the exchange rate market but you know the MMT point of, uh, has always been I mean, and you can see it especially if you look closer at like those technical descriptions is that the, uh, a monetary sovereign can buy whatever goods are for sale in its own currency. That doesn't mean that it can, you know, buy the world and then, you know, have the exchange rate fall. Um, it, you know, it, it might be able to do that, but that's a concrete situation. You know, when you're, it's a different thing, you know, when an importer comes and they're stocking the, uh, the shelves at Tesco or, you know, a foreign company opens up a, a, a grocery chain and is selling in your, in your currency, then you, you know, trying to go out into the world to other places to buy things. Um, I would say more generally on the exchange rate stability point is that, um, you know, you can have a depreciating exchange rate that goes along with these big pump priming pro programs, spending on spending that mostly focuses on capital goods, especially for a developing country where they might have to import the capital goods. Um, but this is particularly why, and the, the, this is particularly why MMT focuses on a job guarantee. That the job guarantee isn't just something that logically comes out of um, the government creation of unemployment through taxation and private property rights, though it does. It's not just something that um, we do because we think it's more direct, but the importance of, job, of direct job creation and a job guarantee in its directness is the fact that we don't have to go through a whole bunch of other non-labor resources in order to get what we ultimately want to do is employ labor. And also from a green perspective, from, you know, especially if you take like Fadil Kaboob's point of view, the, a job guarantee helps restructure the economy. So, you know, part of a job guarantee can both be making our, our systems of inputs and outputs both more green, as in they use less energy and use less non-renewable inputs, but also that it can make it more, um, make it more less, make that economy less dependent on imports. And so, you know, from from an MMT point of view, a job guarantee is you know, the best way to directly eliminate unemployment. But it's also a way of making a government more monetary sovereign um, by. In by especially in, in particular situations where there is really large dependence on importing food and energy, make that economy more independent of those imports, um, and, and so and that's the that's the focus of 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 the that that sort of job guarantee analysis. If you look at uh, Pavlina Chechenova's papers, she has an extension or uh, a reproduction of Minsky's arguments about the late 1960s that the, there were all these side effects of trying to generate full employment um, through these big spending projects and, you know, essentially rely on jobs to trickle down. And we want to, uh, uh, you know, skip the, the trickle down process and that there's potentially, you know, 
uh, unintended consequences or perhaps even intended consequences that we wouldn't like that involves environmental degradation, increasing inequality on these big spending projects. Not to say that we don't ever need to do a big infrastructure uh, project, but that isn't the best way to deal with our employment problems. Um, and, you know, so from on, in a particular sort of way, a job guarantee is better at dealing with the exchange rate than not doing a job guarantee because it's only through a job guarantee that you get that sort of uh, transformation of the input output structure of transformation of make sure that we don't rely less on importing food and energy because if you keep the same structure even if you keep unemployment high there's no process that's transforming these economies and you can see that very clearly in when there was huge spending cuts in African countries in the 80s um, tremendous ones you know savage you know, the things that absolutely devastated these economies uh, Graeber's account of Madagascar I think is particularly compelling in that regard of just like not spending the pennies on the mosquito nets after we've you've you know we've had these mosquito nets for so long and you know lost our resistance to it and then letting the <laughs> and letting the pestilence run throughout the population again that that not only is it destructive and inhumane but also those places become more not less dependent uh, on uh, on on importing inputs or even just in the extreme case of just you know Americans by their benevolence, you know, or other countries by their benevolence, you know, providing uh, directly f food through, you know, quote unquote charity, um, that that they become that there's just more dependence on for on foreign inputs, not less that comes to this structure. Good. Um, wanted to just switch track for a second. Um, while we're worried about um, inflation or what government spending can do, um, right now there's a hyperinflation in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Are you able to talk about where that comes from? Yeah. Um, well, so I would... Did they, I would, did they print too many I, Venezuelan... Yeah, I would... <laughs> what I would preface no. with is Reality. by no means an expert in Venezuela. Sure. Uh, especially do not, do not read or speak the language, which is always going to be a barrier in terms of providing an inaccurate analysis. So from a certain point of view, a full MMT analysis of, of Venezuela will have to uh, wait for someone with the necessary expertise to take on an MMT lens and, and and look at that. That being said, I do think that there's some broad things that we can that we can see from the outside. First, we can see that historically, um, Venezuela has had an especial and incredible um, uh, rel reliance on foreign imported food. Just absolutely tremendous. There was like a certain point where like 90% of the food is imported um, in, in, the, in the mid 2000s. It was just Incre it's incredible dependence, and it's always had these problems. You can read, you know, accounts of in 1994 of them trying to deal with their exchange rate system and deal with their um, extreme dependence on foreign inputs, and the the crisis that um, that 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 happened because of that. So there's no way you can say that the structural problems that are happening in Venezuela are particularly, you know, a problem of Chavismo or, um, or Maduro. And these are long-term structural problems in Venezuela. The best you can say, is, or the, the, the most critical thing you can say of the Venezuelan government is that they, f is that they failed to, to fix the structural problems. Um, but there's also tremendous constraints uh, on them in terms of fixing those structural problems. So, you know, in this context, what's the only thing that's ever really kept Venezuela uh, stable for any given amount of time has been um, foreign borrow borrowing in for foreign uh, currencies in order to essentially pay for food, which is obviously not a sustainable situation, or the fact that the oil prices were high enough that Venezuela's particular high cost oil was profitable to um, uh, to get the foreign exchange revenue um, to buy. Now, obviously, a country that is, you know, 
com very dependent on uh, imported inputs and has a very limited export market, um, basically lives or dies by one market, is going to be a country that's much, much more fragile from an MMT point of view than one that's less dependent on imported inputs. And if they are dependent, has a sort of a varied and um, diverse uh, export structure it was a series of exports that they can uh, that they can rely on so that you know if something happens in the market of one of those uh, exports they are not completely devastated um, the primary thing the Venezuelan government did was eliminate poverty through importing more food now that was great for a period of time but it didn't deal with the fundamental structure now they did try to do certain things um, to deal with their with the, with their food dependence issues introduce um, certain you know ecological approaches to producing food start trying to food co-ops um, but obviously those efforts were insufficient and in the larger context Venezuela is still you know even with you know this quote unquote leftist uh, authoritarian government um, ha has massive inequalities in in land and to be frank there's a, a strong peasant movement for reclaiming lands from these long style long time uh, landlords and there is persistent assassination of peasants uh, in by, especially through bringing in uh, mercenaries from across the border in Honduras, so uh, or Colombia, um, and so just straightforwardly, if you aren't able to ra ra do uh, land reform that can is, that is the the necessary foundation of uh, of pr of being self sufficient in food, um, then there isn't that much you can do. Now, perhaps if I had been in that situation in the mid-2000s uh, or some other m and economist, they would have been able to come up with, you know, a brilliant structure or, you know, wouldn't have, there, there were certain particular ways that oil revenue was spent that perhaps, you know, an MMT-informed government wouldn't do, or there would have been even more uh, obsessive focus on the, on eliminating food dependence, but I'm reluctant in sort of making a uniform judgment, both because of the lack of expertise, but also because uh, I, it's it's easy to say some some make some claim about theoretical economics, and it's another thing to be concretely dealing with a political situation um, and concretely dealing with the the fact that you know, as no matter how left wing you are. Um, they're still in oligarchy that is perfectly willing to use violence to suppress your supporters. I, I think to, to sort of bring that together, um, the dependence on on food and energy to basically not have a production structure um, that can support public spending in a in a real serious fun, a fundamental way um, is always going to limit what a government can do. Um, you know. The, the, the MMT always says that the constraint on government spending is real resources, is biophysical resources. And if uh, the, 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 the combination of the institutional structure or the political structure that you're dealing with and um, a particularly unfertile, for lack of a better term, biophysical structure, um, the, the combination of those two things means that there, you might not necessarily be able to do a ton uh, from an MMT point of view, even if there is no technical limit to uh, public spending. And so, you know, food, especially food and energy independence is, um, or, or a way, or if there, you know, is some dependence on imported inputs, uh, an export structure that counteracts that um, is key from, uh, from an MMT point of view, especially one that, uh, that I and others and Fadil Kaboob are developing um, to, you know, pursuing public purpose and be able to actualize the kind of economic rights that that we need. I would also say that, you know, the U.S. is at the top of the international uh, currency hierarchy because, you know, everyone and their mother owes dollars no matter what country that they're in, and that that I, from an ethical point of view, I think comes uh, comes with some obligations in the United States um, for balance employment support to countries trying to um, develop a more sustainable
input output structure. But obviously we're, that talks about that that's a radically different political point of view than say the Donald Trump administration. In this country our um, central bank time deposit is called a gilt. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's a government bond is called a gilt. So if you Google around and you'll find the Daily Telegraph um, will say this about gilts. The government issues gilts known as gilt-edged securities to fund its borrowing. In effect, when you buy gilts, you are lending the government money. Issued in £100 units, they promise to pay a fixed income over a fixed term. Investors are repaid the nominal capital value when the gilt matures. Can you talk about why some parts of that passage are incorrect? Well, in a certain sense, they're not incorrect. All those things are check like can be, from a certain point of view are technically true in the sense that a government bond is a government liability. Um, and well, more, but, more to that, in effect, when you uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, the government issues gilts to fund its borrowing. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm the MM. The, the I agree. The MMT line on uh, you know uh, borrowing and. Uh, Borrowing and taxation doesn't fund fund the government, or specifically taxation doesn't fund the government. Um, I agree with that that angle, but to me, that's more a, a rhetorical thing to shock someone into getting them to think about it from a different point of view. From another angle, you could think that funding can just be a technical term of me holding another entity's liabilities. So you can say that, you know, I hold a bank deposit on, you know, from an accounting sense, that uh, that can be a funding a bank. But of course, that, that kind of, like, that term in the accounting sense is just, hmm. it's just accounting. There's no causal mechanism between the two. Um, so funding in the accounting sense isn't causal, and that's what gets people mixed up, is that thinking that there's the causal relationship between, you know, oh, so if I'm, if my, you know, if me holding this government bond funds the government, then if I sell the bonds, then the government won't be, uh, won't be funded. Or if I don't buy the bond, uh, the government won't won't be funded, which that obviously is not the case. Um, so, to me, it's about you know changing <laughs> changing someone's angle on it, and from from a different angle, yes, all these things you know are funding in the sense that they're liabilities. But the the key thing about a liability is what they entail. You know, there's the if you hear if you read commentary on government bonds uh, and on, on borrowing, you know, quote unquote borrowing, on uh, you'll see this term all the time about like, well, what if the 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 bondholder calls in their loan? Well, calling in a loan is a specific term. It's a term in the covenant between a borrower and a lender. So it's you know. For, to, to be able to quote unquote call in anything, you need to have you need you need to have the right to call it in. You know, there's there's you know the point of why certain uh, bonds are called covenant light, and you know in in the the government bond case, there are no covenants in government bonds because you know we're already you know essentially giving you this interest for free. You know what we were supposed to give you some other things, some other nice special rights for free. <laughs> well, we don't do that. You know, yeah. private borrowers enter into covenants all the time over their borrowing because you know because there is a real dependence there, and they you know they have to you know concede to their lenders certain requirements. Requirements to you know do X Y or Z to you know not pay the CAO as much or you know limit how much dividends they're going to pay. But you know government doesn't end in uh, enter in such covenants because we are setting the terms of how these instruments are issued. You know, you know the, the term you use when you when you were first mentioning uh, time deposits is exactly the right way to angle. You know in in the U.S. actually there are actually now central bank. Uh, term deposits. They're called term deposits. And, you know, that is a very interesting way of, of thinking about it because essentially the difference between a term deposit at the Federal Reserve and um, a government bond is the fact that uh, the term deposit is not negotiable, meaning you can't just sell it to anyone. Whereas, you know, the, what we like to say about, you know, a government, uh, a, gov a government time deposit, it's essentially a negotiable certificate of deposit because it's negotiable because you can sell it to anyone. Um, and you can especially see that in the, in the, 
uh, in the U.S. case because the and I think probably a bunch of others, but I know concretely the U.S. case. Literally, the Federal Reserve does the bookkeeping. The Federal Reserve is the one that keeps the book of the treasuries. If you if you decide to go purchase a treasury, the person you check in for your account is uh, is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the is the one that deals with the book accounting of transferring uh, transferring. Um, bonds from one person to another. And this happened in the process of them getting rid of literal physical um, government bonds. Once they got rid of them, they just moved purely to uh, a book a uh, book accounting system. And very easily that could be the liability of the central bank and uh, could be just, you know, a central bank obligation, which obviously would make it obvious to everyone because, you know, a lot of the incoherent you know, arguments that we deal with, there are people who um, sometimes they can even acknowledge that central banks create money, but the disconnect between, well, it's still government borrowing because, you know, we don't have control of the treasure, the central bank, or whatever it is, that would all be swept away if, you know, the government just had a credit line, a, a limited line of credit uh, from the central bank, and the central bank issued central bank securities, which, by the way, is an already existing instrument. Um, in countries, in in other other countries, especially, you know, most notably China, um, when they want to buy foreign currencies on the foreign exchange market, well, if you think about it, if they buy it with their with their settlement balances, then that can create excess settlement balances, which can have all the effects of not being able to hint the interest rate target that you that w- that we talked about before. Well, so, but but the difference is in this other case, there's sort of this um, this this institutional habit of the of the treasury issuing a government bond every time it spends, so that there's always this matching process. So they don't have to worry about it in the in the government spending case. But there is no similar matching for when they just decide to go buy a bunch of a, a bunch of foreign currencies to buy a bunch of dollars or euros or whatever it is. So the the solution all of these uh, governments have come to, especially Eastern, Euro- Eastern East Asian co- uh, countries have come to, which is just issue a central bank security. And, you know, from, from our point of view, from, you know, something that Roan and I have been pushing for um, is that one of the ways to make the MMT point more obvious is to just, you know, we should be pushing for central bank securities um, and for all, you know, issuing of interest-bearing liabilities to be central bank securities and providing this unlimited line of credit or issuing the platinum coin um, to, and, and rely on that because that makes the operations clear. Um, Rowan has gone all the way with his paper on digital fiat currency, which says that whenever a bank makes a loan, rather than creating a bank deposit, what should be created is a government IOU, this digital fiat currency, which goes in their you know electronic wallet, and the bank gets an automatic overdraft from the central bank, and that would make it clear that the that. That would make you know what we what we'd argue is just true, that the bank is a franchise of the government and is being given access to ban- to the government's money creation power. That would just you know become directly obviously true because you would have you would just get government digital money into your digital wallet, uh, and then if you want to withdraw thing withdraw money, you'd get uh, physical uh, physical government money. And it would just be directly our obligation, obviously our obligation, not contingently our obligation because of lender of last resort or, you know, partial uh, government guarantees to deposits, the FDIC, all this stuff. You just make it direct and obvious, you know, to go back to that individual versus system perspective, the, you know, the the key point to these, uh, to... Uh, pushing for these reforms is to make the systemic obvious even from the individual point of view. And if everyone had government digital fiat currency in their digital wallet uh, rather than a bank deposit, then the, the institutional would be obvious individually. And it's the same if there were central bank securities out there. Well, that must be the central bank's obligation. And I think that that's uh, you know, you know, a big part of you know what Ron and I have been pushing lately is about making what we think is just just true more obvious, and pr- uh, proposing relatively simple ways in which the 
in which you can sweep away the obscuring, uh, the obscuring institutional practices that have uh, evolved over many, many decades and just uh, <laughs> reveal the truth to everyone. So speaking of truths being obscured, do you reckon you'd be able to describe what quantitative easing is? Ah, uh, the, 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 the infamous term. Yeah. Um, well, on a, on a certain simple level, it's just buying a government bond. Just when the central bank buys a government bond. That's, you know, you know all the ma- mysticism and magic around it. They just bought a government bond. It's just, you know, in this situation, rather than the government bond being having a one-year maturity, it has a 10-year maturity or a 30-year maturity. It's a long-term government bond. Um, and, and essentially all that means is that it's worth less now than another bond is. Um, Rowan has a paper he just presented uh, in, or in New Orleans where he does this very fun thing where he says that you can uh, eliminate all references to time uh, in the government bond market, but you can just replace it with colors. <laughs> and what we now have is, you know, lower maturities would just be blue, and then as you get to further maturities, it would be green. And as you get to the long-term maturities, it would be red. And it's just all, and everything is just the blue are uh, worth the blue are worth near par. The the green are worth further away from par, somewhere between very far away from par and relatively close to par and the red are very far away from par and you know all the governments moving interest rates around and buying and selling bonds all that does is uh, change the relationship to par so we can take the red and we can make it real close to par and we can take the green and we can make it closer to par or hey we can you know make the short term we can make the blue really long away from par and make the red close to par and that was operation twist you know you get the you get the short term interest rate up and you get the long term interest rate down so you know the, the uh, 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 quantitative easing is just shifting the the red up. You Got just you, you just shift the red up. Um, the complication, what you know, whatever makes everyone go crazy, is the fact that we went to that system that I was describing earlier, of the government making of the central bank making sure that there's exactly the amount of settlement balances in held by central held by private banks that or chartered banks that there needs to be. No more, no less. And in that kind of structure, you know, any movement down in the government, in the treasury's checking account, or any, you know, movement of cash out of the sudden, you know, withdrawals of cash means that they have to constantly move to jump, you know. Essentially, the most important thing about that older system of, you know, of reserve finite system, if you want to put it that way, is... You have all these bureaucrats who are constantly jumping around, having to adjust for the littlest thing. Um, in a with quantitative easing, with the sudden purchase of a ton of those bonds, that went away. Instead of you know playing this game and dancing around and having to constantly adjust and worry at a day-to-day basis what the treasury's you know checking account would balance would be, you know whether it's you know it's supposed to be always be five billion, it's supposed to keep it at five billion. Well, when we move to this excess settlement balance regime, where there's three trillion more than the banks need to meet their reserve requirements and to make payments, what does any of that matter? Yeah, we don't have to. Changed. We don't have to. We don't have to worry about it anymore. You just pay the interest on their checking account, just like they're supposed to be with our accounts, but don't, and uh, and you know, be done with it. Uh, and so the, that's really qu- what quantitative easing is. It's, it's just these two things together. It's just you know buying a bunch of long-term government bonds and uh, paying interest on settlement balances, on excess settlement balances, and having excess settlement balances. So you don't have to worry and scrimp and you know constantly react. And basically, you know, the New York uh, bond trading desk, you know got a lot less busy and a lot less frantic on a day-to-day basis. That was probably the most relevant and most important effect it had is on those, you know, 15 bureaucrats' lives. So, uh, just to uh, put uh, something that Warren said uh, into this, he said worse than doing nothing, QE, it did nothing, um, 
it removed a lot of income from, say, the US economy. I'm sure it did in the UK economy because of the interest income channel. Am I using that yeah. that term right in the yeah. in context? Could you describe to the layman what so, I mean by that? So, um, if you th- so, first thing I would say is um, so it was deflationary, right? Yeah, um, or potentially. Yeah. So, the you know, in the economy, there are people who you know owe a lot more than they got in, they have in assets, especially financial assets. So they're net worth is not low or negative and there's people with a lot of financial net worth and they're getting you know a big chunk of their income earning interest so when you lower interest rates um, or uh, you have this this you know contradictory effect you you you're taking income away from some people and uh, and you're getting income to other people QE worse than all of that um, because QE didn't just say we're going to set this interest rate, uh, we're going to set with thirty year, we're going to set one percent interest rate on all those bonds, like for example Japan does. They just announced quantities. The in- the long term interest rates still bounced around. You know the 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 huge amount of government of of bond buying they did had comparatively little effect on interest rates. Whereas if you just announce what the interest rate is, then there's no, you don't need to buy any bonds at all because you know everyone will believe you. Maybe someone will cash out a bond eventually by selling it to you because they are you know, actually going to use the cash for something else. But um, there's comparatively little buying. So in, in that situation, what QE did was take a lot of interest in, income out of the economy. Remember, they bought trillions of bonds. There's still two and a half trillion bonds um, held by the Federal Reserve. But by the way, I talked about it a little bit in my uh, FT Alphaville column. <coughs> um, and so it took a lot of interest income out of the economy, billions and billions of dollars. If you look at, if you subtract out the um, the, the debt service from on uh, government bonds uh, from the total amount of interest paid by the government, <clears throat> the amount absolutely collapses uh, in the QE era. So it took out a whole bunch of interest income from people, while at the same time didn't really lower, you know, government bond interest rates la- that much. Let alone that those government bond interest ma- uh, rates didn't necessarily translate for private borrowers. And that especially makes sense because if private borrowers, especially, you know, the pr- most prominent borrowing is happening because of mortgages, and, you know, we just had a housing market collapse, well, then why would, you know, houses, homeowners aren't particularly credit worthy in that situation. Um, the uh, professor at, uh, at John Jay, in, the CUNY uh, in, in New York, uh, J.W. Mason, has this paper called Loose Money High Rates, which is all about how even if you lower interest rates a lot, especially the short-term interest rate, that doesn't necessarily uh, feed out through the rest of the interest rate structure. And that's, you know, sans whether interest rates have that much effect on people's spending choices, um, certain, um, especially their effect on borrowers or, um, or businesses. And so when you, when you take all that into account, certainly probably is the case that QE especially um, didn't uh, had had this net impact, although it's hard to say because where's that interest rate, uh, interest payments going? Are they going to a pension fund? If they're going to a pension fund and the pension fund isn't defaulting on their obligations, then there's a certain circumscribed amount that gets paid out to pensioners uh, regardless. I mean, well, what Warren does a good job of talking about uh, often is, is, is that you have all these sort of institutional money managers who, have, who are seeking interest and seeking income um, regardless of the state of the economy. And as the, that grows and grows and grows, they need a certain return in order to meet their obligations. But on the other hand, when their returns go up a lot, they don't pay out more. They just pay out what they're obligated to pay out. And so this becomes a structure on the economy which you know, drags down. Their need for, for safe assets and their, that, that constant need and the fact that that need doesn't vary with the state of the economy means that you know, we have this overhang which 
either leads to stagnation or we uh, we we meet with uh, government spending. Or the third alternative was is to reform these pensions and to go to pay as you go social security and make you know raise social security a lot and have everyone get the same retirement benefit rather than have the sort of financialized structure attached to the economy that's draining income and demand. Great. Well, thanks for all this time you've given me. What's the next thing I should read or watch or listen to to deepen my knowledge? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if you've <laughs> seen the um, the Minsky movie. No, I haven't. Uh, the, it's on, actually on Netflix. Uh, oh, with, wow. With Terry Jones. Oh, wow. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Terry How long has it been up? Uh, a few years now. It came oh my out. God, I can't believe it. Like spring to 2016 oh. and at Steve Keen's very kind suggestion they suggested interviewing me and because you know the thing you about documentaries is the last people you interview are the people that will show up the most in the movie because it's only at the end that you realize the specific kind of cut lines that you need uh, and so it just happened to say it's, I was one of the last people that they could ask you know, particular Minsky questions and gave them a few lines. So I'm like randomly in that film like three times. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, what's it called? The Minsky movie? No, no, it's um, Boom Bust Boom. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, look out for that. Yeah. Ray's in there. There's uh, Steam Keenan is in there for just one bit. I think the, the problem, as I said earlier, the problem is he was interviewed early. Um, but, uh, you know, you know what? I'll, I'll take the opportunity to recommend. Uh, a book a little bit off the beaten path, uh, which is uh, the myth of the medieval Jewish moneylender, uh, which I'm really interested in. Yes. I'm actually writing a book review of it. Um, it's this amazing two-volume book, but what I find most interesting about it, and most interesting about it from an MMT point of view, is it was how much of our ideas about money are built up into the myth of the Jewish moneylender. That a lot of, you know, what, what Scott Ferguson would call, you know, liberal ideas about money are baked into seeing uh, money as, you know, something that merges externally, that comes from without, that is ahistorical, not part, and, and asocial. And um, there's, you know, the, the big sort of, I, she wouldn't say villain, but the, the villain of her, of her story is the German historical school. And a big part of the German historical school, especially this guy, uh, 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 Werner uh, Sombart is this is this sort of this this sort of crude historical stages argument about where people go through a natural economy or a barter economy and then goes through this the, these steps until they get to you know advanced economy and in that story what's so interesting about that story which is taking essentially the barter myth but taking it in a way that you haven't really seen discussed in anywhere else is showing that in the context of a barter myth and explaining the emergency of, mon of emergence of money in the medieval economy, which for some reason they take as like these are young nations and thus they are natural economies, is where is money coming from? Well, in this story, it's coming from Jews externally who are coming from an old society where they've already developed money. And so they're coming and asocially and amorally injecting money into that society. Um, and, and that's where money emerges in, in the medieval world, rather than there should just being a continuity from uh, ancient Sumer and ancient Egypt through ancient Greece, ancient Rome, um, into the medieval times. And, and, and what's interesting about that is that the, the liberal idea of money and the sort of philo-Semitic idea of money doesn't attack this myth. What it does is it, say, it, is it says... Um, well, yeah, you know, the Jews brought the money, but that was good because it brought economic development and, and capitalism, and we wouldn't have capitalism without that. And isn't capitalism great? And so what I find interesting is that from, there's something here that's, you know, has a lot of interesting things to say from an MMT point of view and a Graeber point of view talking about the myth of barter, um, but providing a whole different angle and a whole different topic that you don't even really think about and and working through the, how the the real toxic impacts of the myth of barter. I mean, I might hmm. want to say for a technical monetary understanding of the world that there are problems with the myth of barter, but it, what, it's a nice example of how the how ideas, uh, liberal ideas about money is as, 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 as again Scott Ferguson says um, becomes something that uh, 
not, not just you know wrong, but actually can, is fundamentally toxic to understanding the world and people's and people's lives. And so you know, <laughs> blowing away the the myth of the economic function of the Jews, which is how she puts it, uh, is uh, is is important to. to having an understanding of, of what's going on and so this weird sort of obscure something you, you don't really think of anymore ha, uh, idea about you know the Jews being the old society that brought it to this new natural society um, uh, is fascinating and she so she does agree I mean it's a it's a little technical but it's I think it's readable um, okay. although I'm writing a book review to make it even more readable, more legible to an MMT audience. And and what's great is she does this history explaining these ideas and where they came from, and she does the debunking. She does goes through tax records in Britain to show that there, there weren't any more money lenders in the Jewish burgers than there were in the non-Jewish ones. And she she does similar things for other other places in Europe. Should we just jump in there and just quickly, if you've got time, uh, what is the myth of barter? Um, the myth of barter is the idea that money um, emerges sort of just privately, illegally, through people's needs to interact with each other. Um, the, the paradigmatic example of, uh, in, of the myth of barter is you have these two neighbors and they're just next to each other and one, you know, needs a, needs a shovel, but the other guy, d and the other guy has a shovel, but he doesn't need, you know, whatever uh, Joe has right now. You have to wait for and the double coincidence yeah, of wants. Yeah, you have wants. to wait, exactly. You yeah. have to wait for that double coincidence of wants. What can you do? Um, you know, Graber's great example is, well, first of all, we need to know something more about these people. Um, and also, what is this community, which we have no examples of, where neighbors are next to each other, where they just, there will be absolutely no social relations between them. Um, it's, you know, it's a very modern idea that comes with a, a cap capitalist uh, economy, private property rights, you know, you, you have to have all these things and, and money, but it's taking something that, that only makes sense in a monetary, in a modern monetary economy, which is, you know, neighbors not really interacting, even though they're neighbors, um, and, 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 and drops it into this, you know, mythical pre-mortal past. So the, the, the Graeber point of view or the MMT point of view uh, is that this is obviously insane and that neighbors don't barter with each other. They have all sorts of complicated relations depending on uh, the, the time and the people but and the history, but they don't have that kind of relation. And that and thus that there is sort of some sort of social process, obligations, whether it's, you know, gifts and reciprocity or hierarchy that uh, distributes the necessary goods within a community. And that, yes, there might be some, you know, quote unquote, bartering um, between groups, but that doesn't take the form that economists posit, is, uh, posit it as, and it doesn't develop, out of, or our historical evidence is that money doesn't develop out of that, but money develops through those other obligations, through the Virgil, through the, 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 the debts and sins that we generate with each other because I stabbed you or your cousin in the, in the foot or something. And it's that kind of thing that money comes out of, which is why um, debt and sin are so close. Uh, uh, closely associated than these, you know, these other arrangements. And then other, the other point which Graeber makes, which is good and sort of humorous, is that, you know, when strain, when you have small groups of people and they encounter a whole other group of people, well, there's a lot more they're interested in than just, you know, oh, I've got to get, you know, get a good deal for their thing. You know, they're encountering people who might be, you know, attractive, who might be all these different things. That and you know he goes through some uh, some ritualized examples of the of that of of those instincts and you know it's it's almost quaint and boring uh, how economists you know see a situation which you know from a human point of view has such. Uh, intrigue and imagination and goes, well, they're probably, you know, really focused on exchange ratios in that time. <laughs> you just reminded me of, um, I think Donald Trump tweeted yesterday, you know, our, uh, our, our, our fallen soldiers would be so proud if they could see how well the economy's doing <laughs> under my, <laughs> yeah. and somebody to quote tweeted that and put, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
American soldier breaks free from the grave, <laughs> shakes the dirt loose, and goes, "Hey, how's the Nasdaq doing?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly, no, exactly. It's it's just like, wow, God, if I had lived to see the day that unemployment would again be four point five percent. That's what I was fighting for the yeah. whole time. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. It's always the top of my head. I mean, yeah, it's that sort of very strange sort of abstracted, you know, idea. Like, even if you're worried about economic prospects, you know, the it would be, you know, I hope there's, you know, good fortune has come to my grandson or something. It's not this, uh, you know, this like, well, I've, you know, checked the stats. All right. Well, listen, thanks for your time, Nathan. No uh, Nathan Tankus, research scholar at the Modern Monetary Network. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Glad to be here. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. You can get in touch with us via Twitter. Patricia is at Patricia N. Pino. And I'm Christ Riley. You can also email me at ChristRiley at Outlook.com. I'm going to spell those for you. Patricia is at P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-N-P-I-N-O and I'm at C-H-R-I-S-T-R-E-I-L-L-Y. We hope to hear from you and we hope you can tune in next week. Thanks for listening. It's not going away. It's, it's not going away, is it? It's not. I mean, if an idiot like me is asking about it, it's not going away. <laughs>